Um, so welcome everyone to the Youth Financial Summit's professor presentation. Today's speaker is Professor Subramanian, a distinguished professor of finance at UCLA. Thank you so much for joining us. We know you have a lot to share, um, so take it away. Yep. Thanks so much, Aditya, and thanks everyone for inviting me to do this um, honor for the inaugural uh, summit. Um, as you know, it's like, it's a vast field, this finance field. And um, my challenge was to get something that's reasonably accessible uh, and sort of stimulating. So uh, I'm making no apologies for the fact that you know, some of this stuff to some of you might be, oh, we kind of know that. But my goal here is to expose you to the evidence as we see it and as we teach our students in their first finance class so that you can have a good idea of the principles we try to impart. Um, and the difference is probably that it's more evidence-based for professors. So we don't really teach anything unless we actually see reliable evidence supporting it. So that's the difference. Um, and so from that, it's the, from that standpoint that I'm making this presentation. However, it's my goal to have a lot of Q&A. So um, feel free to interrupt me uh, by just chiming in because I might not see my chat. So just chime in if you want. And obviously we'll have at least 20 minutes in the end um, to for Q&A. So uh, I'll be sure to finish by 10 past. Um, as I said, however, if you have any questions, pressing questions when I'm talking, feel free to say I have a question. The chat is kind of unreliable because when I'm talking and looking at chat, it's kind of complicated. It's distracting for me. So um, and unfortunately, as you grow older, multitasking is much more hard, much harder. So that's the problem. All right, so from that, so in that spirit, let's get started. So I'm basically a professor at UCLA's Anderson School. I'm also its alumnus from, I got my PhD there um, and I've been a professor for about, goodness knows, 30 years maybe. Um, and my career started at Columbia University and then I basically returned uh, to where I got my PhD. Um, I essentially, um, specialize in investments and I have a popular elective in the MBA program here called behavioral finance, which is uh, usually uh, in demand. And so the field is somewhat stimulating. And basically what I teach them is like a, similar to what I'm going to, teach, to tell you, uh, talk to you about, um, just a little more statistical evidence and some more nuances to what I'm going to say. All right, so let's get started. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to first talk about are the basics of uh, investing. And then I'm gonna talk about some um, psychological biases that afflict investors so that we can be better investors if we actually um, incorporate those biases into our investing uh, psyche. Um, so I guess it's a two parts. So how to make money, how not to lose money is kind of where I'm coming from. But before we get into the making, making losing money part, let's just get started with thinking about the fundamental building blocks of investing, right? So what I'm going to do now is to first talk about stock markets. Now, I understand everyone is into stocks, they're building portfolios, but let's just get, get down to the real basics and talk about uh, stock markets and how valuable they are to all of us. And so, you know, it's almost sometimes politically unpopular to talk about stock markets. People say they're casinos, get rich quick schemes. But what I'm going to tell you now is that uh, is the fundamental things that we teach our students in the very first or second class of finance, that patient investment in strong stock markets is an important source of uh, long-term financial security. Um, and so a big part of the intergenerational wealth transfers, which contribute to cross-sectional dispersion and um, um, asset values or holdings is basically having the wherewithal to actually invest in stocks. And not just that, patience is the virtue that if, you be in, if you're going to be in stocks and you're going to go in and out, as you'll see later, it's going to destroy us. So the basic idea here is patience. Okay? By patience, I mean this picture. So in this picture, um, which is called the Ibbotson chart, um, had someone invested $1 in uh, stocks uh, in 1926, uh, that $1 in large stocks would have grown to 7,000. 7, 7, so 1,000 bucks would have become 7 million, right? Um, and that's the light blue line. Um, large stock simply is a 10% largest by market cap. And if you had invested the same in small stocks, then that would have become 33 million. Okay, 1,000 would have become 33 million. That's the dark blue line, okay, $1, 32,000. Um, and now you say, well, what about inflation? Unfortunately, or fortunately, the inflation part is only making the one buck into 14 bucks, right? 
but uh, this is a logarithmic scale. Uh, it's not uh, proportional. And you can see that how valuable stock investment is. So even if you do absolutely nothing and simply leave it in stocks and you forget the blips, uh, peaks and troughs in the middle, you still see that you know, it's like a monumental increase in wealth. Um, had you done the same thing in bonds, like government bonds, um, and one buck would have become basically 142. So 1,000 would have become a 142,000 compared to small companies, which would have become 32 million for a thousand buck investment. For the so it's not about inflation at all. It's just that stocks are a really good deal, right? And so that's called often called the equity premium puzzle that stocks are remarkably good deals. Now you might say, oh, why is that the case? And the reason is that in general, we say stock markets underestimate big innovations. So once in a while, we'll have the Wright brothers. Once in a while, we'll have the internet. Once in a while, we'll have Google. And those things just get underestimated by markets. And they contribute to the dramatic increase in market caps and, uh, and uh, create this immense increase in wealth. So patience is one thing that we need to master based on this picture. We'll keep going. And so another thing that we must understand, I mean, you might say you know this, but I would still like to point out the beauty of compounding, right? So, you know, if you invest a dollar at 10% for 10 years, simple interest, then it's 10 times 10, which is a doubling, which is, to, which is pretty good. But if you get to reinvest the 10% back into the markets at 10%, right? Then you get uh, one plus 10% multiplied by one plus 10% 10 times, right? So that's 1.1 to the power of 10, which is 2.59. So the $1 doesn't just double, but it becomes 2.59, right? Um, and so you get an extra 60% over the doubling over the 10 year period. So the compounding obviously is increasing in the number of periods non-linearly, as you can see, and it dramatically is higher when you have higher rates of return, right? And so that's basically what this, what's going on here that stocks offer a really attractive annual rate of return. Um, and even though they're kind of risky, uh, the fact is because of compounding, you get a dramatic increase in wealth because of the reinvestment, uh, making the situation non-linear, right? You can see that. Let's talk a little bit about uh, one thing that's a virtue in the stock market, which is dollar cost averaging. Uh, essentially, dollar cost averaging is doing nothing but simply investing constant dollar amounts per period. So you're just transferring a certain fixed amount into the um, stock market. Um, and so uh, you could argue like, what's the big deal about that? The reason that's a big deal is that if you transfer a fixed amount like a thousand bucks, as opposed to buying a fixed number of shares, I'm saying just fix, fix dollar amount of a thousand bucks uh, per month. The point with that is that um, you'll buy fewer shares when the price is high and more shares when the price is low, right? So you're going to invest, buy more shares in the market's undervalued, the price is low. And you're going to buy fewer shares when the market's overvalued and the price is high. So if the market goes through these cycles of misvaluation over and undervaluation, uh, then dollar cost averaging essentially is going to help you, right? Uh, beyond an investor who's buy and hold. And the reason is simple that you get to uh, exploit mean reversion in stock prices. So that's another important thing to note as to why people emphasize the virtue of investing constant dollar amounts. Okay, all this requires nothing but patience and uh, the ability to ride out the highs and lows. We'll come back. Let me um, help you also uh, understand the other aspect of uh, uh, basic security that we invest in, which is basically bonds, right? Now, I wanted to help you understand the current environment in the bond market, as well as what, is, what it means to invest in bonds, right? Okay, so what is a bond? Um, people often say, let's invest in the bond market. What exactly does it mean? Well, a bond is, again, you might know this. I'm just going to help you understand the fundamental basics and where we are right now. So a bond essentially pays you periodic interest called coupons and a principal in the end of the life, right? Okay. So when you take out a loan to the other side, you pay a fixed interest rate and then you pay back the principal, right? A bond is a mirror image of that. If you invest in a bond, you get interest at a fixed rate, which is called the coupon rate, and then you get back the principal. Right? <clears throat> we call the principal face value. So let's say you have a 2% coupon on a face value uh, of 100, that's two bucks a year, right? That's essentially the story. Okay. Okay. So suppose I say that you get a bond with a 2% coupon with a face value of 100, which matures in 10 years, right? 
That's about the full definition of a bond. There's a coupon rate, a face value, and a maturity. Now, this thing is going to have a price because the price is going to say, say what the bond worth to you, the investor today, right? Um, which fluctuates based on demand and supply. If people want bonds uh, of a certain maturity, then price, they really want them, price will be high and vice versa. Right? There's another animal called the yield on a bond, which is uh, essentially works as follows. It's the effective annual rate interest rate over the life of the bond. Now, that interest rate is not the same as the coupon rate. And let me tell you why that is. Um, suppose the face value or the principal is 100 bucks, right? But the price of a bond today in the market is 90 and the coupon's 2%. Then the effective rate also builds in the price appreciation between the um, uh, 90 and the 100, okay? Um, so the price of the bond's going to appreciate from 90 to 100 at the maturity date because at the maturity date, it's going to be worth the principal amount. That's what you're going to get back, right? At the maturity date. Um, so the yield's going to be higher than 2% because the yield builds in the price appreciation over the life of the bond. That's the difference between the yield and the coupon. The coupon's fixed, but the yield also builds in the price appreciation uh, between what it is today and what it'll be at maturity. Right? Now, suppose instead the price is 110, which is above the principal amount, then the yield would be lower than 10% because the bond's going to go from 110 to 100 over the life of the bond, right? Because at the end of the life, it's going to be worth 100. So the yield's going to be lower than 2%. So the yield essentially is different from the coupon in that the yield also builds on the extra appreciation or depreciation um, over the life of the bond. And that's why we call the yield the effective annual interest rate. Right? So that's the number that people look at. Now, why did I say all that? I wanted to show you where we are today. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so these are the yields. Um, just look at the yield column, yield percentage column from the Wall Street Journal. Um, as of yesterday. Um, so the yield, which is the number that I referred to on the previous slide, um, is essentially, as you can see, uh, ranging from um, one and a half to 2.3% 2, 2 um, from a two year maturity date to a 30 year, right? Now the note versus bond is basically a trivial distinction, which we are not going to work with, to emphasize here. It's a trivial distinction. Basically we view them all as bonds, right? Um, you can see that the environment for bonds is abysmal, okay? And I'll tell you why. The effective rate on 30-year bond is basically 2.3%. And that's when you lock in your money for 30 years. Whereas as you know, inflation is currently running at at least 5%, if not more. The current most recent number was more than 7%. So if you lock in your money at 30 year, for 30 years, you're only getting an interest rate of 2.8 to 2.3%, whereas inflation is running at 7%. So if you put it, lock it up in a bond, you're losing money, right? Net of inflation. Okay, that's why people are chasing yields in the stock market um, and other things we'll come to in a bit for the simple reason that it's simply not, uh, bonds are not competitive, right? Bonds could be competitive in certain times, but not right now, right? Uh, the situation is uh, abysmal, right? So you lock in your money for 10 years, you get base barely 2% and inflation 7%. And so that, that's the problem. Why that's happening is a separate story. We can do it in the Q&A, but it's to do with the federal, policy, federal reserve policies. We'll, come, we'll get to that eventually, but this is just to give you basics for where we are. Now let's get back to um, investment and stocks. Okay, so that's just the basic building blocks. I want to give you um, a basic uh, principle for investing in stocks, um, which is that, <clears throat> which is the principle that we call investing in quality. Now you might say, well, what that exactly mean? Well, investing in quality simply means actually fairly trivial things. It simply means investing in high quality stocks and being patient. A lot of churn in the stock market doesn't help as you'll see. What you need to look for are stocks that essentially are high quality companies. So here's a very simple piece of evidence that you might uh, consider. Suppose you divide up stocks into three groups, high profitability, medium profitability, and low profitability. Okay? And profitability simply means uh, how, how much money does it make, right? That's it. I'll define it more precisely in just a bit, but think about it as simply uh, how, much, how, much, how much money does it make, simple. Um, as you can see um, in an international context globally, 
um, the performance of uh, companies that are very, very profitable is much, much higher than companies with mediocre profitability, right? Um, the divergence is sharp. Um, and because of that, I think that you can sort of think about this as, you know, if nothing else, just look for quality, right? Don't go for the most recent, recent fad, right? Just go for quality, right? Just, and going for quality actually is a surprisingly powerful principle in investments. Okay. And so that's a, something that you want to emphasize um, that sometimes it doesn't take much analysis, but just going with the building block of whether the company is profitable. Now you might then say, well, how do we define profitability? As I said, does it make money? But there's a specific uh, number that I want to emphasize in the context of a specific example. So here's Amazon's stock price over the last uh, three and a half years, right? It's basically uh, behaved this way, right? Um, and so if I match it up with a number that I'll call gross profits, as you can see, they're stratospheric, right? So if you look at 2018 to 2021, the profits, uh, the gross profits have simply gone through the roof. What is then gross profit? Here's what gross profit is. And that's the most powerful number that you should look at, uh, at least as far as the statistical evidence is concerned. It's not the net income, but it's the gross profit. What is gross profit? Gross profit is total revenue minus what we call cost of revenue. The cost of revenue relates specifically to the business operations of the company, how much you sold and what was the cost of producing those things, okay? Now there's items that affect the net income beyond gross profit. For example, if you have um, depreciation on equipment, like you know, equipment uh, getting dated over time, you have to deduct the depreciation according to certain rules. You're paying interest on debt, that's gonna be deducted and so on and so forth. These items don't count in cost of revenue. Cost of revenue is simply, uh, what does it cost to manufacture something, right? That's it. What does it cost to sell something? All the other ancillary items like interest and depreciation are taken out. Right? So that gross profit as a bottom line is very powerful for the simple reason that that's what governs the efficiency of the operations of the company, right? Your goal is to sell as much as you can at as low a cost as you can. And Therefore, focusing on gross profits is much more powerful for investment performance than focusing on um, total profits. And that's another important principle that you should adopt, that we found that gross profits are much more powerful predictor of future returns than simple uh, uh, total profits. So that's uh, something to think about. Another powerful piece of information is contained in what we call um, analyst forecasts. Um, so. Um, if you look at, for example, Yahoo Finance, right, you'll see a bunch of analysts forecasting earnings for Amazon. For example, there's about uh, 36 analysts forecasting earnings for the March earnings release of Amazon, which will be in April 2022, right? So um, the average estimate across the 36 analysts is 867. That's the number on the left, right? Um, and... <clears throat> then obviously there's a high estimate and a low estimate. Okay. Now, if you think about this estimate that 8.67 for the March 22 earnings release, which will happen in sometime in April, right? Um, that number isn't static. So if I look at that number sometime two weeks down the road, that number will change because the analyst opinions keep getting revised. Right? Now, why do these uh, things keep getting revised is the question, because analysts update their opinions um, uh, in terms of what they think the stock um, uh, what the earnings will look like, right? More information comes in, they change their estimate. Um, the, what we found is that the second most powerful uh, indicator of where the stock's going is in fact, uh, how the analysts are revising these estimates. Okay. So if the estimates are being revised upward, right? That's indicative that the analysts are becoming more optimistic. And if the analysts are revising their estimates downward, then it, see, it means that the analysts are becoming more pessimistic. Okay. Now, without getting into the nitty gritty of this uh, basic idea, it simply is, is the uh, notion that this 867 number keeps getting revised, all right? And it so turns out, sorry, that, that the um, information contained in the revisions is extremely strong. So the notion is that if you look at that number and it's going up, that's a strong indication that uh, the stocks are bought, right? And vice versa. So as you can see from this chart, uh, the green one is when the estimated revision was up more than 5% this month relative to the previous month. 
And um, the red line is simply the estimated revision is up rather than conditioning on the percentage uh, increase. And so you can see that the divergence in performance there um, is quite large. So there's tremendous information contained in what the analysts are doing. Okay. So that, that's another important indicator. So it's very simple things that, um, what are the gross profits looking like? And are people in the market becoming more optimistic about what the earnings are gonna look like? These types of things have a tremendous uh, forecasting power. Um, and it seems that they should be part of the uh, analytical tools um, in uh, investing. Now there's more to it than that, but obviously I don't have time to get into every one of those things, but this is just two of the more important things. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about some biases. In other words, when I invest, I invest as a human being and um, human beings have issues and problems. So let's talk about a couple of um, issues and problems that affect our performance as investors, according to psychologists and behavioral economists. So I'll focus your attention on two biases. The first one I'll call extrapolation bias. And the second one I'll call um, overconfidence, which leads to excessive trading. So, <clears throat> Um, extrapolation bias is the following problem that I have as an investor. I get really excited by um, A, word of mouth, and B, how the thing has done in the past, right? So I say, look at Bitcoin, and I say, oh my goodness, look at that thing. It's gone up 600%. I got to get a piece of the action, right? Or, um, oh, look at that thing. Uh, it's on a tear. It's gone up 200% in the last couple of years. I got to get into that. Um, that's called extrapolation bias, that we're sort of saying the future is going to resemble the past. And many people have this bias that, you know, things are going to look the same going forward, so I better get in, get in before it's too late, right? But remember that in investments, we, it's a very simple, trivial thing that we want to buy low, sell high. So when you're buying high, you're going to get into some problems, all right? So a long term of rising prices might mean the stock's overvalued, so you have to be careful about that. I'd like to give you an example of this uh, extrapolation bias problem. Um, so here's the rise and fall of FANG stocks. Uh, FANG is, before it became Meta, the original stock, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, um, Google, and Alphabet, rather, and the market, okay? So um, you can see that from uh, 13 to, to 2013 to 2018, which is the left, FANGs were on a tear, right? Uh, so if you conditioned in the past five years, you would say, wow, Fang, my God, it's amazing. Let's get into it, right? Uh, get into Netflix. It seemed like a great idea and so on and so forth in 2018 based on past performance, right? Um, but if you did that and you got into that in the, in the next year or two, then you find that performance was mediocre. So the run just exhausted us. Right? Um, in general, uh, what we say is that uh, a short term of trend might be replicated because there seems to be some momentum, but it's extremely dangerous to condition on longer term trends. So like what the stock's done last two years doesn't help you forecast uh, uh, with any precision that is gonna do well in the next two years. If anything, it seems contrarian strategies work better. So be very careful about conditioning on long-term performance because by the time it gets to you, uh, it's too late and it's just um, overlapping. So important to not simply chase trends, uh, particularly long-term trends. Uh, it's very important. <clears throat> uh, the next thing I'd like to point out is that I have another problem, which is that I trade too much. Right? Not me, I'm saying there's an example. I trade too much, which is that basically we kind of get information from the popular press, from word of mouth, from uh, um, our social socials and so on and so forth and say like, oh my goodness, this seems like a great idea. Let's get into it. But if you simply trade based on hunches and intuition and gut feelings, it can be counterproductive. In fact, evidence exists that uh, performance is negatively related to trading intensity, uh, which means that uh, the, uh, if you simply measure trading intensity by a number called turnover, right? Turnover is simply how, much, how many dollars you traded as a proportion of your portfolio. So if your portfolio is 100,000 and you traded um, 50,000, then your turnover is 50%. It turned over 50%, right? Um, in fact, there's an inverse relationship between the return net of commissions and the turnover. So to the right, we have the accounts which turned over the most, the, the top fifth by turnover 
they had the lowest return net of commissions. Net returns means net of commissions. And if you look at the leftmost um, thing, it has the accounts with almost zero turnover um, and they earn the highest net return. So if you stratify account, brokerage accounts by turnover, right? There's an inverse relationship between the accounts that trade the most, right? And or turnover the most and the performance, net of commissions, right? So what this suggests is that a thoughtful trades are better than trading based on hunches and intuition. A thoughtfully done trades are probably going to be more work better, right? So too much trading is a danger, right? We shouldn't trade too much. Um, and so that's another thing to keep in mind. Another thing I'd like to propose to you, which is an important issue that um, I might succumb to, which is also something to keep in mind, is the power of uh, brand perceptions, right? Brand name companies actually are a huge pitfall in the stock market, okay? And the problem is that uh, there's too much pent up demand for them, particularly in the IPO market. So let me give you a couple of examples. An initial public offering happens when a privately held company uh, lists on an exchange and floats shares to the public, as many of you might know, right? Unfortunately, there's an important rule about IPOs that one must know, which is that um, IPOs are actually bad investments um, in the long run, um, particularly brand name IPOs. And the reason this happens is that when the IPO happens, particularly of a brand name company, uh, there's too much demand for it, okay? So the price established at the beginning is just too high. And going forward, these things are, um, uh, are don't do that well. One issue there to keep in mind is the role of what we call managerial market time. So what this means is that um, if Uber goes public, it's because it knows it'll get a favorable valuation, right? By the market, that's when it goes public. But if you think about it, if it gets a favorable valuation, the investor gets an overvaluation, right? It gets a great price for its shares, but the investor overpays. However, since Uber gets to time the IPO, not the investor, Uber decides when to go public, Uber will pick a point in its life when it's overvalued, right? Well, I would pick any other point. It wants the best price for its shares. So it's the reverse of what the investor wants. The investor wants to buy low, sell high, but Uber wants to sell high, right? But Uber can do it, if, uh, can time it, you can't, right? So if you buy Uber at the IPO, you're gonna lose money, going forward, right? And that's counter, it's counterintuitive because you'd say Uber is a great company. Well, Uber may be a great company, but the price ain't right because they're timing it. Um, and so be careful about investing in hot IPOs because uh, that's not always a great idea. Off, more often than not, actually, it's a bad idea. Um, if you look at Nextdoor's IPO, people lost money on it. And here's the case of Facebook or Meta after its IPO, right? A couple of years, didn't do that well. Uber, after the IPO, didn't do that well. The reason this happens is, again, um, the management times the IPO, right, to take advantage of the overvaluation, uh, overvaluation window. And um, there's too much pent-up demand for it, so people oversubscribe which means price too high. So if you really think these are good companies, the paradox of this is that it's better to be patient and give it a couple of months for the heating to subside and then um, get into it, right? So with IPOs, it's wise to wait rather than try to get into it first because everyone's trying to do that exact same thing and you'll over. And so that's important. <clears throat> All right, so that's as far as IPOs are concerned. So those are the, some of the things that I wanted to emphasize in relation to um, you know, stocks, right? These are some principles that you, we need, we need to uh, understand. What I'm gonna do now is to get into some alternative investments in the last 10 to 15 minutes or so, and then we'll take questions. Um, okay. So in the next um, uh, 10 minutes or so, let me get into some alternative investments. Um, I don't know how many of you might know what an option is, but these things are getting more and more popular. So what I'd like to do is to give you some um, basic exposure of, to what an option is and talk about some pitfalls about investing in options. And then I'll talk about a couple of other things and then we, we're basically done. So let's talk about options. And what's, a call, what's an option? Let's talk about um, what types of options we see. The two types of options out there are call options and put options. Now, business schools offer entire courses on options markets. 
it is extremely difficult to teach you everything about options in the time that we have allocated. But still, I think I should tell you what an option is. So a call option on Tesla, TSLA, for example, is the right to buy Tesla at a fixed price, which is called a strike price, prior to a specified expiration date. So suppose the strike is at 900 for an option, which is a fixed, actually it's, for any given option, the strike is fixed. It's a feature of the option, what is the strike? So suppose the strike is at 900, okay? And Tesla is at 930 today in, these, in the underlying market, right? Then your immediate gross profit from the option is 30 bucks because if you exercise the option, you essentially pay 900 to get a stock worth 930, right? So you get 30, you make 30 bucks. Because it's an option, if Tesla is less than 900, your profit's not negative, it's just zero. Right? So it's an option. You can choose to do it, but you don't have to. So when Tesla is less than 900, you won't do it. Because why would you buy Tesla at 900 when the price is less than 900 for Tesla? Okay. Now, the gross profit is either 30 or zero in this example, but the net profit is net of what you paid for the option. So the option costs money, you gotta pay for it, right? If you're getting this option, the right to buy Tesla at a fixed price is not free, you gotta pay for it, right? So you pay something for it. Now that option price in this case is going to be more than 30. Uh, because it also includes the time value. The option gives you the right to do this at any time between now and the expiration date. So the price is going to be more than 30, right? Because it's going to build in the time value. <clears throat> so that's what an option is. And the put option is the flip side of it. It's the right to sell Tesla at a fixed price, but we're not going to get into put options here, just to give you a feel for what this is. <clears throat> now to give you a feel for a couple of uh, things that I'd like to emphasize, um, Options are what we call levered bets, okay? Because for the small upfront cost, uh, you're going to control large percentage gains and losses. Let me tell you why. Because if you want to do Tesla, you got to pay the 900 bucks per share. But for the option, you're going to pay some number about 30, but it's not going to be even close to 100. It's going to be some number between 30 and 50, like, right? So you get, the, get to participate in the upside and downside of Tesla at a much lower price, right? So that's essentially what that point means. However, the important thing to note is that the com the, a complete loss is quite likely in options and it's unlikely in the stock itself. Why is this? Because if you, to lose your entire investment in Tesla requires Tesla to go from 900 to zero, right? right? You lose everything in the stock investment only if the stock goes to zero. But the com there's a com complete loss is very likely in options because for the option to expire worthless, I'm sorry, only requires Tesla to end up below 900. The strikes at 900, so as long as Tesla, as soon as Tesla hits 900 and stays below 900, you've lost everything, right? right? So it's highly likely you lose everything in an option market. And that's not the case in stocks. Right? And so the seller of the option is betting that the option will expire worthless because they sold it to you, right? They got the money up front. And if it expires worthless, they keep the money. And the buyer is expecting it won't worth, expire worthless because then they get to pocket the net profit. So that's how options markets work. Um, so be, be careful because uh, again, it could be a fad based on, for example, stories like this. So here's a story from the Wall Street Journal that says uh, Bruce Burnworth entered a 23,000 options gamble on Tesla and earned really two million, nearly 2 million bucks. He owns a Tesla and he also helped his daughter buy home and purchase the Tesla SUV for another family member. And this was a story in the Wall Street Journal of all places on December 27, 2020. Um, options can become a fad, all right? And they can attract eyeballs, but you don't hear of the losing trades. All those people who lost their shirts in the options market will not have their stories published in the Wall Street Journal. So be careful not to succumb to fads and get into an options bet only if you're darn sure that the bet's gonna pay off. There's a good, because there's a good chance that you lose everything, right? So unless you're abs absolutely sure that this is what you want and you can pretty much tell where the stock's gonna go, don't do the options deal. Uh, not everyone's gonna be a Bruce Burnworth, they could just get lucky and get themselves published in the Wall Street Journal. So be careful. Okay. Um, last five or six minutes, I'm going to expose you to some alternative assets really quickly. <clears throat> um, I'll talk about cryptos very briefly. Um, cryptos are very speculative. 
nobody really understands the business model as to why they might be successful. For example, Bitcoin, it's been extremely volatile and it seems that people are betting that it will become the medium of exchange in the future, but governments aren't willing to let go of their currencies. And it's not clear what they're used for other than you know, under the table, deals on the dark web. So it's not obvious to uh, people like us as to be, whether people actually understand cryptos or they're betting on a wing and a prayer. And we think it's the latter. So to keep that in mind, people often say peer-to-peer -peer lending like SoFi is a good thing, good thing to invest in, but peer-to-peer -peer lending tends to have extremely high default rates, extremely high, 20 to 30%. So we do not recommend that. Okay, so if somebody says P2P, be careful. Real estate investment trusts, REITs, are a portfolios of commercial real estate. And uh, when people have a lot of free money floating around, like right now, people don't know what to spend it on, REITs can be a really good deal because they're essentially claims to commercial real estate. Uh, they're traded as stocks, right? Um, the stocks which are a claim to a portfolios of commercial real estate. These are attractive in periods where there's a lot of free money floating around, like right now. Uh, people are coming out of the pandemic, they don't know what to spend their money on, and so real estate is booming. So it's something to think about. I want to talk a little bit about NFTs, um, uh, which are non-fungible tokens. And so let me give you an example of an NFT. Today, you can buy a non-fungible token um, of the following type for exactly $2. Okay. Um, non-fungible token is a right to a, a piece of electronics. It could be um, a cartoon, could be a painting, it could be a footage of a backstage video of a famous pop star or NBA authorized footage of a basketball star. For example, here's an NFT, a Malik Monk dunk video, Lakers. After a failed driving attempt by Oklahoma City's Darius, Mock converts on the other end with a twisting 200 throwdown. Okay, this is a footage of um, a dunk by Malik, and you can buy it, and uh, you can buy it at two bucks and keep it, and they can sell it on an exchange for whatever price it's worth later. But just two bucks, okay, that's an NFT. You can have NFT on lots of other things, but I think that the professors are pretty excited about NFTs because we think that for the following reason. Here's the reason. <clears throat> So NFTs are a bet on future popularity, right? If the Malik becomes an even bigger superstar than he is now, then this thing could be worth like what, 50, 100, whatever, we don't know, right? But it requires very little to get into it right now, I should say, right? Uh, you can get them from pennies in unproven cases. So let's say that you have um, a good sports acumen, right? Like you can figure out where a star is going based on their talent today, right? Then you can buy them on the pennies right now and if you have careful analysis and acumen, you can actually help identify potentially lucrative tokens. The point is that we understand NFTs much better than cryptos, right? They're a bet on future talent, right? Cryptos aren't a bet on anything, literally, at this point. We don't understand. But NFTs are. We, they're a bet on future talent. And that's something uh, that uh, we need to give careful thought to. Some people may well have the acumen to figure out where uh, the talent is and where it's expected to go. Right? So that's something to think about. In other words, NFTs are better understood and more importantly, it's cheap to get into them. Okay, so that's always valuable in investments. Okay, those are my uh, thoughts on how you should focus your investing acumen. And just to summarize, um, so I would say equities are crucial to, for any portfolio, but um, there are certain principles that one should follow. Um, you can either passively invest in the market index, or if you want to construct a portfolio of individual stocks, then you should not get carried away with fashions and fads, um, like brand name IPOs. You should look for profitable companies. Um, I would like to add that they should not have too much volatility, uh, otherwise your capital becomes uh, too risky. So profitable companies with low volatility seems reasonable. Um, um, cautionary warning for IPO investments and options, especially in popular IPOs and stocks like Tesla, because uh, there's a danger that you could get carried away by fashion and a fad and, uh, and invest in extremely risky things that have the potential to either be overvalued 
or be extremely risky investments. Um, and importantly, we should invest in things we understand. What exactly is the business model and what are we betting on? More importantly, what's our risk profile? How much risk are we taking? Okay, and not just because it's popular and because a bunch of people are telling us on our socials that we should do it. That's the latter is a really bad reason to do something, right? So invest in things we understand and not because of popularity. Uh, it's very important. <clears throat> and then the other thing I'd like to point out is that if you made a bet, um, stick to it. Write out the highs and lows, be patient. Okay? Uh, and so that is basically it. All right, so that's the end of my talk. What I'm going to do now is to stop sharing my screen. Um, then we can take questions. All right. Um, All right. Thank you yeah. so much for that presentation. Um, of course, it's open um, to anyone to ask questions, but we do have a few questions that were submitted in advance. Um, so if you could answer those first, that would be excellent. Absolutely. All right. So I'm just going to go down the form. Uh, the first question was, um, in the current climate of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, what market sectors do you think we positively affect in the short term? Uh, okay, so the first question that arises in this case is, what do you what what do you think is the impact of the Ukraine invasion on the United States economy? Right, that's that's a good question to first try and ask. Um, and I'm wondering if there is in fact going to be a long run impact on the US economy because of the invasion of Ukraine or not. And I would suggest to you that probably not, okay? Now, if you just want to think about the short term impact of the Ukraine invasion on the stock market, as you know, when it was initially in the rumor there's going to be an invasion, there was a huge negative impact on the markets. But within a couple of days when the invasion actually happened, paradoxically, the market rebounded, right? And we've seen this repeatedly in the stock market that whenever there's a significant um, global event, the market initially um, panics and there's an overselling and then followed by correction as the market understands that the initial reaction was just a panic attack. So one thing that you might want to consider is that yes, the media is full of it. If you look at any reasonable news channel, they'll have 24 seven coverage of Ukraine because after COVID they have, they have something else to talk about at this point, so they'll do it. But then you have to worry about like, what exactly is the impact of this gonna be, right? Um, let's just see exactly why the Ukraine invasion happened. It happened because Putin is getting concerned that Ukraine wants to join NATO. And then he thinks he'll lose that buffer. And if Ukraine also joins NATO, then NATO becomes too strong and Russia gets threatened, right? That's basically the reason. So now the question that the danger of this is that Ukraine, uh, done, sorry, Russia then starts, moves to Latvia, Lithuania, and all these Baltic states, and maybe Finland. They, they can't really do that. They can't touch a NATO state. They, they won't do that. That's too much of a risk. It's mutually assured destruction to attack a NATO state. The difference is Ukraine is not part of NATO, right? So I would suggest to you, actually, the answer to the question is, if at all, the defense sector, um, aerospace, right? It'd be a good bet at this point in time. But in the longer run, very little impact. Uh, if anything, aerospace. But other than that, I don't think there's going to be much impact. You wouldn't dare attack anyone else because part of NATO. You just won't. Kazakhstan's another matter. I don't know. But Kazakhstan's not the strategic term, right? It's Ukraine that's a buffer between the NATO and him. And he's just concerned that Ukraine's going to go to NATO. So that's it. That's my prediction. Okay. Great. Um, next question kind of relates to the Ukraine situation. If Russia seizes control over Ukraine and its neon resources, how do you see this affecting the chip market and its tangential businesses? Um, I'm sorry, I, I missed the first part, Aditya. Could you repeat the first part? What was that? Chip market yeah. part. Yeah. If Russia seizes control over Ukraine and its neon resources, how do you see this affecting the chip market and tangential businesses? Um, okay, so here's the thing. Let me Let me ask you this. What's in Putin's interest? Now, nobody excuses what he's doing, right? Like, maybe some people do, <laughs> but most people would say that uh, violating international border integrity at this point in time arbitrarily is not a good idea. Just because you think you can, you shouldn't, right? So we agree with that. So it's not a great thing to do, probably a very bad thing to do. But forgetting that, the moral aspects of it, will 
Russia actually destroy the golden goose, that's the, that's the Ukraine markets, right? And I would suggest to you that it's in his interest, even if he takes over, to let Ukraine's business sector do exactly what it does, right? So that's, that's I'm not worried about, all the natural gas business and stuff. Like, they would just open it up and say, like, sorry, but business as usual. We want the GDP contributions that Ukraine gives us, right? That doesn't mean we shouldn't go and defend Ukraine. That's a different story. But in terms of the business model, I don't think that he would touch it. However, here's what I am concerned about, which is that if, uh, if the China attacks Taiwan, then we really do have an impact on the chip market in the short run because the business model would change, right? Um, there's more of a, you know, a non-market economy taking over. And so we don't know how much market power that China would get from that. And that I think would be a bigger threat. So I would keep a very close watch on what happens in the uh, North Pacific. That would be my suggestion. But as of now, as far as Ukraine is concerned, I think the impact will be minimal in the long run. The next month might be a month of upheaval, but in the long run, I don't think much will change. The uh, Business-wise, it's a different story as to whether it's the right thing to do. I'm not commenting on that in a strong way, except to say that it doesn't look like it. That's it. <clears throat> Great. Uh, next question is a total change of topic, um, but what kinds of topics are taught in finance at UCLA Finance? Okay, so, I mean, I'm not really sure what people are interested in, but um, I think, um, see, there's a difference between uh, becoming successful as an individual investor and becoming successful as a professional investor, right? And I think that the business, all MBA programs, uh, no matter which MBA program you go to work on or whatever it is, uh, will all be focused on the professional aspects of it. So you learn things about risk management, how to construct a portfolio, how to manage a portfolio, uh, how to calculate value at risk, um, you know, how to run a hedge fund, um, how to market your fund to public, to the public. Um, if you want to set up an investment fund, how can you ensure it's successful? How to manage the regulatory environment, right, of a professional fund? Um, in terms of the corporate finance angle, you know, um, how do you make business decisions? What criteria are used to make business decisions? How do you decide if a venture is good for the company? Then the VC market, private, um, the nu nuances of the VC market, private equity, and so on and so forth. So it's a very business oriented thing. It's not really focused on become, becoming a successful individual investor. That would be my perspective. <clears throat> uh, next question is, have you heard of CNN's fear and greed index? If you have, how important do you think the two emotions are in the stock market? Okay. Um, I have heard of it, and I think they're extremely important in the stock market. In fact, um, all right. So if you don't mind, um, I'll expose you to um, a quantity called Schiller's Cape. Um, <clears throat> So this thing that you see in front of you is something that you might want to Google at your convenience if you haven't heard of it, but it's a better metric for fear and greed than the CNN's fear and greed index because it's a little more um, quantitatively inclined than some sort of black box thing that we don't really understand on how they compute it. So the Schiller escape uh, is actually a very powerful predictor of market returns. In other words, think about where the market's going in the next year. Uh, Schiller Cape, uh, Schiller Cape, the Schiller's Cape has been extremely successful in predicting that. Now you might then say, what is exactly Schiller's Cape? And so let me briefly sketch it out for you um, um, uh, using um, <clears throat> really quickly. Um, so if you think about the market um, as, um, I suppose this is the fundamental, okay? And that's the price. If you think about the market as um, go, fluctuating like a sine wave relative to the fundamental, whatever the long run fundamental is, it's a reasonable model of the market because here um, greed dominates and here it's fear that dominates, right? So when people are very greedy, it's going to be basically here and people are fearful, it's going to be undervalued and it's going to be here, right? So the price to fundamental is going to predict returns um, negatively, right? Because if the price to fundamentals is high, then you're going to be somewhere here and the return is going to be low and the price to fundamentals and vice versa, right? So if you can figure out a ratio price to fundamentals, then it's inversely related to returns, right? So the CAPE is essentially works as follows. It's the price divided by 
12 year, uh, 12 year average earnings on the market, cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so the reason that the escape business is important is because it essentially tells you if people are greedy or fearful. So as Warren Buffett says, you should be in the market when people are fearful and you should be out of the market when people are greedy. And the CAPE ratio is a good way to figure it out because um, you don't want to um, scale it by the most current earnings as the fundamental because that's very noisy, right? So you say, well, let's smooth out the earnings over the past 12 years and take the current price and divide it by that. And if you do that, then essentially, you're essentially measuring a proxy for PF, right? So when PF is high, CAPE is high, markets don't do that well and vice versa. And this is actually a very potent predictor over the next 12 to 24 months as to which way the market's going. So you need to, uh, we need to sort of get into the habit of looking at the CAPE ratio. And you can Google it and find more information about it. So I would say something like the CAPE ratio is probably much more useful than the CNN's greed and fear index. But I think greed and fear are very important aspects of the markets that the investor must understand. And that's it. Got it. All right, next question was, um, I know investors and academics have their own definitions of risk. What is your definition of risk? Ah, uh, my definition of risk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I like, um, um, I like the con concept of value at risk that we call VAR. Um, which is essentially, um, you know, if you've ever taken a statistics class or, you know, if you're high school students or undergraduates, you understand the concept of means and standard deviations. And you might have seen something called the Z-score where you look up a table, a normal table and read out the area to the left of a tail, right? So here's something you might, what's the probability that I lose 5% um, or more on my portfolio in any given point in time, right? So if I give you the mean, and the standard deviation of your portfolio, right? You can compute it based on historical statistics. Then you can compute the likelihood that the portfolio will lose more than 5% over the next month or so. I think that's the only metric that makes any sense to me because people don't care about the overall standard deviation. What they care about is the downside, right? You know, so the tail events and uh, the losses ensuing. So I would suggest that you read up some basic stats and how to calculate VAR, value at risk. And that's simply the likelihood that you lose more than 5% or something to that effect. You can set it to be 4% or 7%, but the normal convention is 5%. I think that monitoring that probability is a good idea. You want the probability to not be too high. Okay. That'd be my tip. All that's right. It. One more question from the, the pre-written ones or the pre-sent ones. Um, would, you, would you consider NFTs to be an investment or speculation? What is the justification for the growth of a token? Isn't the NFT craze similar to the tulip mania of the 1700s? Ah, that's an excellent question. So it could be, right? But NFTs are not homogeneous goods, you see. All tulips look the same. <laughs> it's just that people wanted the tulips. But NFTs actually are quite different, right? So here's an example. Um, you might, uh, a bunch of people are fans of Sting, a former pop star, right? Some people might be fans of Elton John. Some people might be fans of Britney Spears. Some people might be fans of someone else, right? Eminem or something, right? Um, or the Jonas Brothers or whatever. Okay, so here's the thing. They're not homogeneous, you see? So there's a difference between saying um, NFTs are fans uh, and saying uh, all NFTs are fans, right? Like it may be that on average NFTs are fans, but there may be still some diamonds in the rough. Um, as an example, suppose you have a rookie, a basketball player, who has an NFT attached to him or her at five cents, right? So it could, it's possible, right? Now, suppose that you have some special ability to identify basketball potential. You say that she is WNBA player that could really reach great heights, or he is an NBA player that could really reach great heights. In this situation, if you know this better than others, that you have a sports acumen better than others, and you buy them on, the, you know, on pennies, then think about it, right? In two years time, when the guy actually fulfills his potential, the sky's the limit, five bucks, 10 bucks, 12 bucks. And if you buy uh, like hundred of them at five cents, think about how, how much your wealth will be enhanced. So my point here is that the ability to get them for pennies on the dollar is valuable to someone who has the acumen to anticipate where it's going. And they're not all the same, right? Not everyone is Britney Spears. Some of them are still up and coming talent and you can get these things for very cheaply. So 
My view is that they're not homogeneous, so they can't be equivalent to QLIPS to basically homogeneous except for red and pink, right? There's a lot of variation in what NFTs are offered and there may be some diamonds in the rough is what I'm trying to say. That's it. All right. Um, so let's move on to some of the questions in the chat. Um, how, would, how much would you recommend starting with for stocks or investing? Um, look, you know, first of all, I think that it's much better to have a Warren Buffett strategy having a few stocks that you understand deeply, right? So I would say having more than 10 and having limited time as a student is probably a bad idea because it's going to be a diffusion of responsibility and a distraction and you can't pay equal attention to 15 stocks, right? I think it's a bad idea. Um, I'd say four to eight is a good number. Four seems might be a little low. I mean, it's just my gut feel, right? Gut feelings are not useful, but given my experience, I'd say go to six or seven, right? But don't go more than 10, no matter what, because then you won't understand what you're doing, okay? I won't understand what I'm doing. So I would say, keep it manageable, just go a little higher. That's it. Keep it simple. <laughs> All right. Um, we have a few more questions in the chat. So we'll do the the first three that were sent uh, and then we'll wrap it up for today. Um, so the question is, many value investors tend to sell puts on stocks they believe are undervalued to buy at a margin of safety. Do you think the strategy is effective? Yes. Um, I didn't have time to get into puts, but um, you can read about puts on the uh, on the web. Uh, puts are a good uh, way to get a floor on the value of an investment. So if you think an investment is undervalued, but you're still concerned that there's some downside that you could lose a ton of money and lose your shirt on them, then buying a put can help you protect the losses because the put's the right to sell the stock at a fixed price, right? So you lock in the a fixed price. In other words, you put a floor on the value of an investment. So if you buy a stock and you buy a put on it, you put a floor. So if you want to retain the upside, but to put a floor on the downside and you think the stock's undervalued, then buying a put on it is in fact a valuable strategy because it puts a floor on the value of your investment. It protects you against loss. So yes, the answer is yes. All right. Um, next question is, in the pre presentation, you said that one should look at the guidance of how the guidance of the company is revised. Well, this can be a good metric. Are you not basing your research on the analysts? And in the past, we have seen that analysts are proved to be wrong. Um, that's right. So here's the thing with that, um, uh, the guidance. So the guidance is, there's two kinds of guidance really quickly. One is by the analysts and one is by management. Management also guides um, uh, people. So management will say, look, you know, we expect our earnings to be lower next quarter, be prepared, they'll guide you, right? That's a different guidance. The analyst guidance is simply that they forecast earnings and then they revise the earnings forecast upward or downward as the actual earnings approaches, right? So I'm talking about the latter kind of guidance with the analysts give to the market rather than the managers giving to the market. So there's the analyst guidance. Individual analysts can be wrong, but the what I'm talking about, okay, so this is an important thing to remember. I'm only talking about the consensus forecast, that is say the average because mistakes by analysts cancel out. So any individual analyst can screw up big, but the consensus, the wisdom of the crowd of analysts is tend to be very reliable. So focus on the wisdom of the crowd. Don't focus on individual analysts. They can mess up big. I completely agree. That's it. <clears throat> All right. Um, two more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, how do you invest passively or actively? If actively, what else do you look for in a company apart from profitability and earnings? Okay. So first of all, um, the way I invest, um, I have bulk of my money uh, into a um, growth stock fund, which is essentially funds consisting of stocks which have growth potential, which I think is a good idea. In terms of the uh, individual stock component of the portfolio, which I like, like individual stocks per se that I try to look for, uh, I look for profitability, um, I look for uh, stability, so volatility, low volatility. And the third thing I look for is a metric that's uh, the fundamental to value ratio, which is fundamental to price ratio, and that's in terms of the sine wave that you want to get the stock at an attractive price. So there are many ratios that actually accomplish this, like the price to earnings ratio. Some people uh, look at the price to book value ratio, where the book value comes from the accounting statement, the book value of equity. Um, I would say that uh, price to earnings and price to book relative to its peers, to the industry as a whole, is a good metric for misvaluation. So if a stock is selling for a price earnings that's uh, two times that of the industry, 
it's probably not a good investment because it tends to be overvalued, right? So you want to look for companies that are comparable to the peers in terms of their valuations. So I would say close to the peers for price to book and price to earnings. That's the other metric I'd look for, or maybe even slightly below. That's it. <clears throat> All right. That was a great answer. Uh, last question is, what are your thoughts on modern portfolio theory? Oh, that stuff? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so here's my deal on MPT, okay? I'll call it MPT. Now, some people say it comes out empty, but it is MPT. And that's just a joke, by the way. So really quickly on the MPT part, the problem with MPT is that uh, for those of us who know MPT, it requires inputs for expected returns. Uh, standard deviations and correlation coefficients. It requires, requires inputs. The problem with that is that um, the future is not really very representative of the past, so the inputs can really mess you big, a big time. For example, if volatility turns out to be much lower or higher than anticipated, your allocation can get distorted, right? So I would suggest to you that you combine it with a dose of common sense that if you do do it, you want to make sure that you monitor your input allocations over time and you want to make sure that if any one of those parameters is coming out way different than what you initially anticipated that you adjust it very quickly so you have to monitor it and uh, dynamically is all i'm trying to say but i would say that for investment of between four to eight stocks the inputs are so noisy that i would suggest that equal weighting will do just as well so i would say that it's only for the major billion dollar portfolios that it might matter but as an individual investor, it's just the inputs are so noisy that I wouldn't think it would matter much. That would be my take. That's it. All right. I know so many other people have so many questions, but for the sake of time, we have to wrap it up. Um, thank you so much, Professor, for coming in to speak. And thank you for everyone who's helped um, make this event possible. Um, we'll be moving on to the next part of the event, which is the quizable explanation and quizable filter test. Um, we'll be moving everyone into the main room and then putting them and creating a breakout room for the quiz bowl. Um, so please just wait one or two minutes um, and we'll get everything situated. Thank you yeah, so much. And, okay, and if I could just say something really quickly, you can find my email address in the UCLA um, website. And if you have any questions, just email me. It's fine. I'll take emails. Not a um, would you like you. to put it in the chat? Um, my email address? Uh, okay. The links or any your email address? Yeah, no, this is my email. I'm just uh, typing it up. Make sure it's typo free. That's it. Perfect. All right. Thank you so okay. much. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye.